On November 4th, 300,000 people marched in Washington, D.C., from the Freedom Plaza to the White House, in the largest Palestine Solidarity March in U.S. history. This unprecedented demonstration comes in the wake of Israel's ongoing genocide in the Gaza Strip, which has just surpassed 10,000 casualties. This march was organized by a wide range of Palestinian, Arab, and anti-imperialist groups, including the Palestinian Youth Movement, the Answer Coalition, the People's Forum, and National Students for Justice in Palestine. Hundreds of thousands rallied and then marched to the White House, demanding an end to U.S. funding for Israel and a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. This 300,000 strong march occurred in the heart of Israel's most significant backer, the United States, despite the fact that people in this country have been faced with various forms of repression for supporting Palestine. To speak more about the Palestine Solidarity Movement in North America, People's Dispatch spoke to Yara Shufani of the Palestinian Youth Movement, a Palestinian living in Toronto who has been organizing around the Palestine Solidarity Movement for 10 years. I'm wondering if you could start off by just telling me a bit about yourself, you know, how long you've been organizing in solidarity with Palestine and what drove you to be involved in the first place? I've been organizing around Palestine for over 10 years now, um, and I'm originally Palestinian. Um, my grandfather was exiled uh, in 1948 uh, from Palestine in what Palestinians call the catastrophe or the Nakba, um, and he was 16 years old, um, removed from his village, um, and spent the rest of his life as a refugee. Um, and, you know, for um, all his life, he waited to return to Palestine um, and um, unfortunately was, you know, was never able to return in the course of his life. And so uh, organizing around Palestine for me um, is very much something that's um, reflected in, in my family. And I think that's the story of all or so many Palestinians, right, who are in the uh, far diaspora in North America and Europe and other parts of the world who come to this because they um, grow up hearing stories of exile, stories of dispossession. Um, some of us still have family in Palestine. Um, and so for many Palestinians, it really is a carrying forward of a multi-generational struggle, um, a 75 year long struggle. Um, for freedom and to return to our homeland, um, you know, on behalf of, uh, for many of us, grandparents who've never been able to return. You attended DC, as you as you spoke about before. Um, could you speak about some of your reflections from the march? The march uh, that took place on November 4th in Washington, DC, which the Palestinian Youth Movement and other co-convening organizations um, helped put together was, a historic day, I think, for the Palestinian struggle. Um, it was the largest march in U.S. Uh, history um, focused on Palestine um, with hundreds of thousands of people in attendance. And really, the march had three central demands. One was the demand for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, the second is a demand to end U.S. military uh, aid to Israel. And the third was a uh, a calling to lift the siege on Gaza, which has been ongoing for 17 years, whereby the Zionist state controls um, Gaza's air, land, and water, effectively making the Gaza Strip an open air prison. And um, all of these demands um, really are reflective of a movement that is interested in the question of Palestinian liberation, that is fighting for Palestinian liberation. Um, and what makes it so critical and so historic, I think, is that we were really, it was a show of power in the heart of US empire. Um, you know, we were able to bring together a historic number of people um, and the determination that people had to march to the White House um, in a, and not in a, um, not, you know, with the interest of um, appealing to the American government, which we know has been um, the Zionist state's biggest ally. We know Zionism to be um, uh, you know, the child of Western imperialism, a reflection of Western imperialism in the Middle East. And so 
the march was not about appealing to the United States government, but um, to mobilize the masses to show that the, the United States government um, that this pressure is going to continue and we're going to continue to organize and continue to place pressure um, until a ceasefire is called and until military uh, aid to Israel stops. And what was pretty, what was critical about it was um, the fact that just a few days prior to the march, the Biden administration voted to send an additional $14.3 billion to the Zionist state, effectively rewarding it for its genocide. This $14.3 billion is on top of a $3.8 billion that the, that the United States sends each year to the Zionist state to massacre Palestinians. This is in a country where um, healthcare and education are crying for funding, where people are demanding and have been demanding good jobs, um, public investment in, in infrastructure, in the environment. Um, and so really what the United States is affirming and is telling the American public by choosing to instead send $14.3 billion to a country committing genocide is that its interests are not with the American people, with the American working class, with the public, but rather its interests are in service of empire. And what makes this march so historic in the backdrop of the United States government um, ignoring uh, the masses, ignoring the fact that 66% of the American people want to see a ceasefire um, is also the heightened level of repression that we have seen on Palestinian and Arab and Muslim organizing uh, since um, uh, the beginning of October. We have seen a major crackdown on Palestinian organizing. We have seen the president of the United States um, engage effectively in hate speech against the Palestinian people. And we know that this is because in order to justify and to create public support for Israel's genocide of the Palestinian people, um, the United States must engage in um, both media and political propaganda um, in order to uh, deceive the American public um, and really dismiss, silence, and delegitimize the mass movement of people in the United States and across the world that is fighting for Palestinian liberation. And we know that the impacts of this kind of uh, rhetoric, this kind of repression, surveillance against the Palestinian movement um, is not only uh, going to result in violence against the Palestinian people in, in Gaza and in Palestine, but also has implications for Palestinians living in the United States. We saw just a few weeks ago um, the murder of a six-year-old Palestinian boy in Chicago, uh, which one of the speakers at the march was very clear to say that this is a direct uh, outcome of Joe Biden's um, hate speech against the Palestinian people. Um, and the landlord who murdered the six-year-old Palestinian boy said that he was motivated by um, what he was seeing on his TV, the rhetoric that he was seeing on his TV. And so in this backdrop, in this, um, you know, amidst these conditions of surveillance, of repression, of um, hate speech against the Palestinian people, against Palestinian movement, um, to have a collection or a gathering of uh, over 300,000 people essentially saying we are not afraid. We refuse to be afraid and we are going to make our voices heard. We are going to organize in a show of power and we are going to make sure that the people of Gaza know that that. that they are not alone, and we are going to make sure that the U.S. government knows that its funding for Zionist genocide is not going to go unchallenged, um, truly makes this a historical moment. And you could feel that energy in the crowd, um, the energy of anger that we were gathering at a time where there were 10,000 uh, Palestinians in the last month that had been murdered by the Zionist state, um, nearly half of whom were children. So there was anger and outrage and sadness. But it was um, paired with determination, with the refusal to be afraid, um, and with a determination to organize and continue to organize in service of Palestinian national liberation. Yeah, you definitely mentioned, like, um, you know, the fact that it was historic, the just sheer amount of people and energy. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you could just describe also what it was like to be in the midst of that, right? You know. 
um, marching among 300,000 people. Um, obviously, I think something pretty notable is that the speeches um, and the people that were put forward uh, to speak were actually very openly like anti-imperialist and anti, you know, you know, Zionist, um, something that you don't see in a march of this size. Um, so could you describe a little bit about what that was like for you? Over 75 years, the Palestinian national liberation struggle has been very clear um, that it is an anti-imperialist struggle. This dates all the way back to actually before the creation of the Zionist state. Um, in the 1936 uh, Palestinian Revolution, where the Palestinian peasantry engaged in a uh, historic three-year-long struggle um, against not only Zionist settlement uh, and settlers who were removing the peasantry from the land, but also against the British Empire um, during a time when the British were colonizing Palestine. And so from its earliest days, the Palestinian national liberation struggle has understood itself to be an anti-imperialist struggle and has aligned itself with other anti-imperialist struggles um, and movements for national liberation in the global south. And it was critical for us that a march um, of this size and this kind of historic march um, ref respected and stayed true to the 75 year long Palestinian tradition of anti-colonialism, anti-Zionism and anti-imperialism. Um, and was and while also being able to bring together a broad coalition of people, of organizations, hundreds of endorsing organizations um, and people from all walks of life under um, our demands. And, you know, you could definitely see the level of alliances and um, you know solidarity and internationalism and joint struggle um, in the the speakers. Right, we had speakers from a variety of different organizations, indigenous organizations, black organizations, um, and many others. And the thought process here for us was um, really based in a understanding of Zionism as a um, reflection of Western colonialism and Western imperialism, understanding that uh, Zionism is a threat to the global South um, and has always been a threat to the global South, not only the Arab region uh, where it serves as an outpost for uh, US led empire, but across the world, um, we've seen Zionism's reactionary um, impacts in Latin America, all across Asia, um, through its uh, partnership with the United States. And we've also seen Zionism's repressive um, uh, impacts in the United States, where uh, the Zionist state has trained American police officers. Um, and so we know that Zionism is a reactionary movement. It is a movement that is um, grounded in um, uh, sort of this fascistic um, drive to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian people and to serve as an outpost for Western empire in the, in the Arab world and all across the global South. And so the speakers um, and the uh, chants and the signage that we saw, the banners all across the march really um, reflected uh, the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial nature of the Palestinian national liberation struggle, because ultimately the number that we saw, the you know over 300,000 people that came to the march, it was not only a reflection of a few weeks of tireless organizing for this march, and it was also not only a reflection of the anger and uh, outrage that we're seeing over uh, the Zionist state's uh, gen current genocide on Gaza, um, which we've seen unfold over the last month. Although of course these two things are critical, but it was a reflection and a culmination of 75 years long of our people's struggle. And so it was critical that our messaging and our demands balanced both the need for broad coalitions and a mass movement while also uh, staying true to a 75 year long uh, struggle of our people. You know, I think that coming out of a 300,000 strong march in DC, you see how popular the issue is, you know, among people all across North America. Um, it's really like somewhat of a no brainer at this point 
um, in our political moment that um, there's genocide in Gaza, that it needs to stop. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes like after seeing such a historic march, it can be easy to forget that pro-Palestinian organizing is actually heavily repressed in North America. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit because you alluded to it um, as well, you know, the difficulties of Palestine solidarity organizing in the US and Canada. And if you personally or through your organizing have experienced repression, state repression, you know, um, any sort of repercussions that you want to speak about. Palestinian organizing is uh, heavily rep repressed in, in the imperial court. And that's really a reflection of just how intertwined Zionism and imperialism are, um, whereby uh, imperialist nations like Canada, like the United States and European nations, um, see Palestinian organizing as something that they need to shut down in order to continue to uh, support the Zionist state's genocide against our people. And the way that this repression unfolds um, has all kinds of faces and really reflects a strong relationship between Zionist institutions in uh, the imperial core and the states that, um, uh, and, and the respective uh, Western states like America, Canada, uh, Britain. And what we've seen historically is severe repression on college campuses and university campuses. Uh, campuses have been a major site of struggle uh, where you know Palestinian organizing is repressed, is shut down, is um, uh, come down on by university administrations. We've also seen in the last few years um, the push in Canada, the United States, and other parts of the world for the adoption of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, uh, which, which Zionist institutions have been pushing for. And what this definition basically does is it equates anti-Zionism, so organizing against the Zionist state's ideology, um, to anti-Semitism. And we've seen this definition taken up not only on university campuses, but at state at the state level. And this has represented a critical a site of repression for our people, um, basically conflating uh, fighting for Palestinian national liberation and freedom uh, with hate speech. And we've seen this kind of um, uh, direction uh, and the push for this kind of direction unfolding uh, over the last couple of weeks. So for example, we've seen rhetoric around deportation um, where in Canada, um, just recently um, a few really uh, central um, media figures and public figures have gone and said publicly that Palest those who are uh, joining the protests, who are participating in these protests, should be investigated and deported, right? So we're seeing really a level of rhetoric that we know is going to lead to high levels of re repression, particularly against organizers of these movements, um, whereby um, threats are being made, um, you know, and discourse is being put forward around uh, deportation and uh, criminal charges. Um, and when you really think about it, we're talking about hundreds of thousands in cities and millions across these countries of people who are refusing to cower to this um, repression and this, this rhetoric. But historically, we've also seen really atrocious forms of repression um, that is not only confined to this moment. So for example, there is the case of the Holy Land Five um, where uh, Palestinian um, leaders in the United States are still being held by the United States um, uh, government in prison. And there has been a movement that has been going on uh, for years trying to call for the release of the Holy Land Five. And this is reflective of a history of the repression against movements that are fighting for Palestinian liberation. And I think one of the things that really stood out to me at the march was Muhammad al-Kurd's uh, speech, where he basically said to the crowd, ask the crowd, are you afraid? And the crowd chanted back, no. And he said this, there was this back and forth between him and the crowd a few times where he was 
essentially getting the crowd to get to a point where we're both acknowledging that we are going to see mass levels of repression, that we are already seeing mass levels of repression and surveillance of our movements, while also affirming that um, we will not be silent, even if this repression, even as this repression reaches its peaks, uh, whether that be on university campuses, people losing uh, jobs, so employers coming down on them for speaking up about Palestine, whether that be uh, state-based repression, that there is a whole movement of hundreds of thousands of millions of people who will stand behind us uh, when we face this level of, of repression. You know, I thought that was uh, really remarkable too. And, you know, there were so many um, pe speakers, I think, um, who referred to this idea that, you know, people may be afraid, people may, I mean, even Macklemore brought up, um, you know, people may want to be, be afraid of losing their careers or what have you, but um, this is like a moment, um, a unique moment to be brave. So I think, you know, obviously the march was a testament to that. Um, you know, I think also on that same vein, um, we've definitely touched on it here and there, but um, this is obviously a very unique moment in Palestine solidarity organizing. It's very unprecedented. Um, you know, not only is there this genocide going on in Gaza, but there's also like historic levels of resistance too. And all of that that's happening in Palestine filters into the movements here. Um, and I'm wondering if you, you know, um, could speak to like the uniqueness of the moment and what that warrants in terms of the organizing. It's becoming very clear that the facade of Zionism as um, something that is here to stay um, is slowly um, being ripped off. Um, we are seeing uh, definitely a historic moment across the world, um, you know, and we are seeing, for example, um, workers refuse to transport weapons to the Zionist state. We are seeing mass strikes. We are seeing student walkouts that are going all the way down to high schools. So not even just university campuses, but high school students are walking out in protest of this genocide. We are seeing um, mass movements, but in the and in the global south, we're even seeing nations who are uh, cutting ties to, to the Zionist state, who are recalling ambassadors. And so we're really talking about a global movement. And it is clear that the masses of the world support the Palestinian struggle for liberation. And that is historic and, and a reflection of uh, 75 years long of our people's struggle. And really, I think this is the moment for us to continue to stretch and push and drive the movement forward. We need people to join organizations, to get out on the streets um, and to really take up their role as people who are fighting for our people's struggle. So we are calling on um, people to get organized. This is the moment where we can build uh, a movement um, and really kind of build mass organizations um, so that we make sure that what happened on November 4th is not just a moment, but is actually being directed towards a mass movement that we could continue to build on. And I think what this really indicates is that uh, colonial colonial regimes will fall. All colonial regimes, all uh, colonial empires, um, you know, have to will have to reckon with the uh, power of the people, the power of the organized masses, the revolutionary, the revolutionaries who are leading these movements, who are refusing to um, to buckle um in the face of repression in the face of genocide and really in the context of the palestinian national liberation struggle we are talking about a people who for 75 years have been resisting occupation colonization and imperialism um and they have had the most uh powerful and brutal nations um conspiring against them the united states european nations the zionist state um, and yet the Palestinian people refuse to stop and abandon their national liberation struggle, refuse to capitulate um, and uh, refuse to allow for our people's struggle to be abandoned. And in the context of North America and the context of Europe, uh, the Palestinian people um, refuse to turn our backs on our people in our homeland. We see our struggle 
as um, interconnected, we believe we have a historic role to play in the imperial core, uh, in the heart of empire, in confronting Zionism, in confronting imperialism, um, that we are not only in solidarity with the Palestinian people, but that their struggle and our struggle are this, the same struggle. And this is the uh, what we're calling on people to take up is uh, a form of internationalism that really understands that uh, the Palestinian struggle is at the center of an the anti-imperialist struggle, that, you know, Gaza in particular is a critical part of the anti-imperialist struggle. And for all people who care about the Palestinian um, or who care about revolution, who care about progressive movements, um, Palestine should be a cent central to that. Um, I'm think often of the words of Palestinian um, revolutionary Hassan Kenefani, who uh, said that the Palestinian cause is not a cause for Palestinians only, but a cause for every revolutionary, wherever he is, a cause of the exploited and oppressed masses in our era. And I think that this is the kind of um, outlook to the Palestinian national liberation struggle that we need um, everyone to take up in this moment to see that the struggle for Palestine, that the, the struggle that the people of Gaza have been waging um, is one that is central to uh, the challenging of imperialism and the advancing of uh, a revolution across the world. Thank you so much, Yara.